Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota. I want to start by welcoming uh, to our live stream audience, uh, which is joining us from the Risky Business Projects website. We hope our live audience will also join the conversation on social media. And I don't know much about this stuff, but I am told to read the hashtag <laughs> MWClimateRisk is listed in the program. I also mentioned when I was up here a moment ago the various sponsors of the Economic Club that make these luncheons possible, and I think they were scrolling on the screen. They're also in your brochure, so check that out and show your appreciation to those organizations and individuals. And finally, we want to extend a special welcome to our speakers, Secretary Paulson and Greg Page, and thank them for choosing to release the Risky Business Projects Midwest Report at the Economic Club of Minnesota. Hank Paulson and Greg Page are among the leaders of a new effort to understand the economic risks the U.S. faces from climate change. Paulson, Mike Bloomberg, and Tom Steyer are the co-chairs of this effort called the Risky Business Project. Today, they will release a new report focused on the most important region of the country, the Midwest. And using a classic business risk analysis, the report outlines potential impacts on agriculture, energy, and overall quality of life in our region. The report is sobering, but the good news is that once we understand the risks, we can adapt to some and change others. I look forward to hearing Hank and Greg's perspective on just what this means for Minnesota and the Midwest as a whole. And to get the program underway, I'm gonna ask Muffy McMillan to come and introduce Greg Page. Good afternoon, my name's Muffy McMillan and thank you for coming today. As a former Cargill board member, a McMillan and a board member of the Economic Club, it's my distinct honor to introduce one of our panelists. Wherever I go, and even in general conversation when Cargill comes up, many people comment or ask me about Greg Page. This is always preceded with something like, he's an incredibly smart guy or he's a great representative for corporate America. Those of us in the McMillan and Cargill families are very proud of Greg. After earning a degree in economics at the University of North Dakota in 1974, Greg was hired as a trainee in Cargill's feed division. Since that time, he's worked in various roles with increasing responsibility all over the world. From 2007 through 2013, he served as our CEO, and today he continues as our executive chairman. Some of you know that 2015 is Cargill's 150th anniversary, and in case you don't know, it is our 150th anniversary. <laughs> and for 40 of the company's 150 years, Greg Page has not only been a leader, but a difference maker. Through it all, Greg, pertinent to today's discussion, has been one of those people whom you could count on to grapple with the difficult questions and to do so in very thoughtful ways. That is why he's so often looked to by public policymakers and quoted by the media on how to create a more food secure world by 2050. He also brings unique insight to one of risk, into, he brings, excuse me, unique insight to one of risky business's concerns as to how we do work towards this goal, particularly in the face of climate-related disruptions. And it's my honor to introduce Greg Page. It's my very great privilege to uh, introduce the Honorable Henry M. Paulson, former Secretary of the Treasury and uh, founder and chairman of the Paulson Institute. Uh, when you look at the Paulson Institute's mission, uh, issues of climate change, sustainable economic growth, and our relationship with China, I can't think of three things that will end up 
be more important to uh, where we will all be in 20 years. And uh, no surprise that you have been over your career on the leading edge of many things. Uh, these are all such critically important issues and I think that probably accounts for the very large number of people here in the room. Uh, I have very uh, tangential relationship, uh, more ethereal uh, with, uh, um, with Hank in that uh, I work at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, worked there during those dark days. Uh, mostly we were on the telephone. I was a, just a person in, in the corner of the room listening in, uh, but I really was struck by the Paulson Institute uh, motto, which is think and do, and that was a time for thinking, but definitely a time for doing, and I had the privilege of seeing that in action. There's also another connection and that is, um, as I understand, uh, Hank is a avid bird watcher, and um, I'm a very amateur bird watcher, but I think that anyone who is a bird watcher or wildlife enthusiast knows how critically important uh, climate change is, how radically it's changing the environment for living creatures, um, including ourselves. Um, obviously, you know more about the resume of um, of Hank as his role at Goldman Sachs as the chairman and CEO, his many years there. Uh, so I don't think he needs much more introduction than to say, welcome uh, to uh, the Minnesota Economic Club. I'm Steve Sanger. I'm the uh, uh, chairman or president, Mark. I can remember. I'm the president of the Economic Club of Minnesota. <laughs> <clears throat> and. Um, and just uh, by way of uh, orienting our, our two speakers, who we're delighted to have with us here today, uh, I will tell you that this audience, or many of you in this audience, have uh, heard from John Watson uh, in a prior uh, uh, session talking about energy policy and the future of energy. He's the, he's the CEO, chairman and CEO of Chevron. And also from Doug Baker, who's our CEO of Ecolab here in town, who talked about water. So these are subjects that uh, are, are more granular, but relate certainly to this broader subject of climate change that we're going to tackle here today. Um, but uh, we're delighted to have you both. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions and, and get the dialogue started, and then we'll open it up for questions from the audience. And I'll start with, with Secretary Paulson, I guess. And the first question really is uh, to ask you um, the Risky Business Project and the group that's behind it if you could explain to our audience a little bit about how it came together, who's involved, and, and, uh, and what differentiates it from all of the other climate uh, research uh, stuff that we are kind of bombarded with every day. Well, St excuse me, Steve, thank you very much. And I, I need to just say to this group, thank you for being here. I love this city. Uh, for years, when I ran a Midwestern investment banking business, this was my favorite place to visit. There's got to be something in the water. There's more outstanding companies here per population. And, and the way you work together and the community, it's just a really unique, really unique place. So it's, it's, it's fun for me to be here. Now, a risky business, how did it come together? I was focused primarily in, uh, on China when I was working on the climate issue after having left government. But when this project emerged, <clears throat> what really grabbed my attention and Mike Bloomberg's and Tom Steyer's was this was an opportunity to fill a gap in the United States. Climate had been talked about primarily in the language of science or the environment. And it's a very real economic issue. And it was an opportunity to give business leaders the tools they need to better understand the risks associated with climate, the costs and the risks of doing nothing. Uh, and it was a, a, a way to measure those risks, not with coming up with one answer, but using the very best analytical tools, risk management tools that business has so we can quantify and put probabilities by, you know, worst cases, best cases, you know, some, some very interesting probabilities. The other thing that, two things that appealed to me about this was we were going to do something that was bipartisan. So 
Tom Steyer is a Democrat. Mike Bloomberg and I are Republicans. Bob Rubin, who is on the Risk Committee, is a, is a Democrat, who is a former Treasury Secretary. George Schultz is a Republican. He's Secretary of Everything, you know, at, at one time or another. And so we had people like, outstanding people like Greg, and we just, so we, we put together a team, and the focus wasn't going to be on solutions, which can become very divisive, but as Greg said, we need to start the conversation in the middle. Let's just talk about the issues. And that's what drove me, and then one of the things that has come out of this, which, which should have driven me, was the importance of being able to quantify this, not just by industries, but by location, because just like politics are local, you know, climate is not only a, a global, but a very local issue. So this gives communities an effort to really assess the risks that they face and municipal leaders. Thank you, very good. Uh, and Greg, how, how did you get involved with, uh, with this group? Hank asked. <laughs> That's a, no, it, it'd be persuasive. So, you can. And Hank and I worked together in the Latin American Conservation Council, and, and so we had shared those experiences. But when he called, it precipitated a, a pretty robust dialogue in Cargill of whether we should join. And the reason is the fact that the words climate change are very polarizing language in the, in the farm community. And we probably talked for three or four weeks before I was able to give um, an answer to Hank and decided that the issue of feeding 9 billion people by 2050 in, in a very likely more volatile and very likely warmer uh, agricultural environment was too big an issue for uh, agriculture to just be perceived as deniers. And so we elected to join, and the reason we did is what Hank already covered, the fact that it is amongst the only studies we know that speaks the language of business it talks about the range of scenarios we might confront, so each company can pick a spot on, on that range of scenarios to do their own planning against, and it did not begin with a prescription. And so often, the discussion ends 30 seconds into the meeting because a lot of these studies lead with the answer and the policy prescription. And so we've been delighted with what we've learned by participating with the people that Hank convened. The, uh the subject of, uh, of this, let, let me just make uh, sure that uh, we understand the level of familiarity that this audience has with the uh, risky business uh, product, uh, output product. Originally, uh, the, uh, the national one was published back in August, and you wouldn't be too familiar with the Midwest one probably because it was just released today, but how, just let me see a show of hands. How many people have read or read about or are familiar with the the Risky Business Project. It's a, what would you guess, maybe 20, 10%, 20%. It's a relatively modest group. So I think it would probably be helpful for this group if, if Hank, if you could share kind of the executive summary of the conclusions uh, of, of, of the project. Well, yeah, first of all, it's, it, it's, it's a project, and, and the first look was taking a look nationally, okay, and, and looking at it by region, right down to, you know, to the county level, and uh, looking, focusing on, in addition to regions, focusing on certain industries, you know, fo focusing on, uh, on energy, on housing and construction and, and, and coastal infrastructure. And um, the, the, the conclusions, which shouldn't have been too surprising, but I think they were to me and a number of others, is how local some of the impacts are and, and sort of the disproportionate impacts hitting certain industries and in certain uh, communities and regions. And when the national uh, study came out, a lot of the focus was on the coastal areas in the southeast because they got the double whammy of the, of the sea rise and the, and, and, and the temperature rise. And so there was a lot of focus. But I remember, as, as someone from Illinois, what hit me big time was looking at some of the probabilities around ag. I grew up on a farm, in a farm in Illinois. And so if you looked at the nation, you said, you know, there's the range of probabilities that I was looking at, one of the more likely cases showed a 4% decline in agricultural yields. And, you know, because it, 
But when I looked at Southern Illinois in Iowa, there was a very good likelihood they weren't going to be major corn producers. So as you know, big shifts in climate zones and growing patterns, and, and, and so this would be really it's something that had been a temperate area becoming arid. So these were the kinds of, but there was, the other thing that hit me about the, the, um, the national study was very, very little criticism from the people you ex might have expected criticism from because the analytics were so strong. It was all open source, and they were very interested in, in the data. And some of the criticism we got were from people that were, you know, the, the, the real, you know, ardent uh, advocates of taking action on climate that maybe thought it was too conservative. But it was a, so any of that, that was a project. And then the idea was to take it now, to, to, to take it further. And the Midwest is, the, is, is our first uh, regional study. And we picked the Midwest because there had been so much focus on the coast before. And the Midwest, in many ways, I like to think it represents the best of the USA, and it's a microcosm. You know, you go from, from farms to, to manufacturing, from forests to big cities, and so there's, there has been the focus. And the fact that we're doing this in Minneapolis, well, it's Greg. <laughs> there's one thing you said that I think deserves to be reemphasized, is because so, so often climate change uh, studies are criticized because it's not clear what, where the data came from. It's just, this is it, here's the conclusion, this is, this is all you get. This project is open source, all the data is, is, is open source. So if anyone wants to go in and, and recalculate the risk based on the assumptions they want to make, they can do it. And so as a result, it hasn't lent itself to the kind of, as much of the kind of criticism that quite often these these studies do, um, or, or not these studies, but climate science uh, discussion uh, can, can engender. So Greg, um, you've been and continue to be a leader of one of the, the world's great companies, and you do risk assessment all the time. And <clears throat> my sense is when you, when you encounter risks, you, you can uh, deal with them by trying to prevent the, the risk-creating thing, like in this case, prevent climate change, or uh, if, if you're not in a position to prevent it, you've got to figure out how to adapt uh, to, to whatever it is and, and, and have your organization not be harmed and ideally benefit from whatever happens. And so let me ask you to, to, uh, how you think about this, both from the standpoint of agriculture, which I know you are, are deeply involved with, and then from the standpoint of, of a company like Cargill. So the two words we've tried to talk about is adaptation and resilience. And I try to draw the comparison <clears throat> for agriculture. Some condominiums in Florida with wet basements is one issue. And the inability to feed 9 billion people 30 years from now is an entirely different issue. And so we've tried to use responsibility and morality, that there's a moral element to getting involved. The great news is we start in a great place, the amount of adaptation. I'm a child of the 49th parallel, and the th crops that we can grow in central North Dakota compared to when I graduated from high school is remarkable. And we've adapted, and in some cases benefited from those changes, and so we really want to try to be a voice to call out to agriculture, whether it's the land-grant universities, the genetics companies, John Deere, to get engaged in this discussion and be seen not necessarily as believers and, not, and certainly not as deniers, but to be discussers. And, and so, what are we trying to get done is to build on the investments we've made in adaptation looking backwards and in building the resilience to go forward. Simple example of one that's already in the process of taking place, the inland waterway companies in the United States lobbied Congress and it took over three years to get them to raise our taxes by nine cents a gallon and to commit that money to building the resilience against these five sigma weather events that we've seen on the Missouri and the, and the Mississippi River, we saw it as critical to dealing with some of the probabilities that climate change could put in front of us and to fund that effort on behalf of farmers who need those riverways to market their crops. And so we think it's begin now, do the things that have returns on investment and are economically sensible and do it against a range of plausible weather outcomes. So 
at, at some modest amount of risk, we hope, that, that we think we can be a voice to get that level of discussion, but beyond discussion to actually start making those thousands of incremental improvements in both our greenhouse gas footprint and in our resilience. Um, let's, let's get down to, to the local level. The Midwest report um, uh, not only talks about states, but gets down to metro areas. And so um, I don't know if you, you want to share with us what what uh, the risk uh, that the Twin Cities area faces, but uh, there are quite a few, or a few anyway, uh, significant ones outlined in the report. Let's start with, it's called heat in the heartlands, okay? And because it's a, it's a story of heat. And as Steve has said, we look at various metropolitan areas. And uh, with some, it's, it's very startling. Um, you know, you look out, uh, you know, five to 25 years, which isn't that far in the future. And you take a look at, at, at cities like St. Louis and Chicago, where the number of very hot days, 95 or above, double or quadruple. And you, you, you see a day when summers in St. Louis will be hotter than summers are in Arizona today, or in Chicago, hotter than they are in Texas today. And so, I would start, I always start, and I, I get a laugh, but it's, you know, that as you look at it, one of the impacts is you may have more neighbors from St. Louis or Chicago that are living next to you, or maybe even Texas, and you can figure out whether that's a reward or a risk. But, but, <laughs> but, but, but these things are, be living in the but, 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 the, um, but, but seriously, what heat means, and now I'm, I'm getting very, very serious, because what heat means, it's a big impact on agriculture, it's an impact on manufacturing, it's an impact on labor productivity, uh, on energy use, and on, um, and, and uh, you know, even on safety, because crime rates go up when you, you have increases in heat. So let's just take something like en energy and manufacturing, and I'll use one example for, for uh, Minneapolis, but there are a number of them. So you'll have warmer winters, and again, people laugh about that because it doesn't sound too bad sometime this time of the year, but you also have warmer summers. And, but the impact on energy is clearly bad when you look at the risks because as you, many of you may know, when you get these very hot days, uh, that you know, when you look at generating electricity, the power plants aren't nearly as efficient or in, is in conducting it. So you have that side, and then you use electricity for the cooling, for air conditioning. And so your energy use goes up, and your energy costs go up. And, you know, anywhere from the looks like things I looked at from, you know, maybe 4 to 14 percent. And other places going up much more than that. And of course, electricity is the lifeblood of manufacturing. And the Midwest has more electricity uses per GDP than other regions because of the manufacturing. is 20% higher. And so what you're seeing is, what I'm seeing is a former banker and someone that's looking at manufacturing globally, much more competition now. You should see the competition that different regions and cities and countries go through in order to attract manufacturing investment. And if you're going to build a manufacturing plant, one thing you look at is energy, and you also look at clean energy. We're also seeing decisions being made to build plants in the Pacific Northwest because of hydropower. So that's, that, that, that's one example here. But in terms of the really hot days in the bands I'm looking at, there's a significant increase from what looks like a low level in, in, in Minnesota. The, uh uh, winter economy, to the extent that it's reliant on ice fishing and, uh, and <laughs> snowmobiling, will also be affected uh, by that. Don't forget fishermen like me. I mean, I like to get walleyes and brook trout, and they like cold water. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that is not going to be particularly positive as, as, as we see. Well, that's an important point. We're the headwaters of the Mississippi here. I mean, uh, uh, do, 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 do we see risk to uh, kind of the transportation infrastructure. Uh, You're looking of, at the uh, expert on transportation um, infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, just in the last three years, 
we, we have seen times when the Mississippi are so low, it's not, not navigable commercially, and we've seen times when the water's so high that we can't get the barges under our spouts. And, and so what we're talking about is more volatility, more extremes, be they in temperature or in, in precipitation events. There are things you can do to build resilience in the lock and dam system. I've jokingly said one of the mitigations we can do is to have an elevator on both sides of the Mississippi on the theory it'll only flood one direction. And, <laughs> and, and so if you're on the wrong side, that's, that, as a farmer, that's not a happy uh, form of investment in resilience. But the, the point is getting the discourse started, there are a thousand things that can be done uh, to make the infrastructure that we depend on. It includes county uh, officials. Some of the people that have really enjoyed this county level data are people that are on the county commissioner boards thinking about what kind of culverts are they going to put in as they replace things. Are they going to prepare themselves for having the 500 year flood every three or four years? And so a lot of this can be done as part of the normal refreshment of our, our capital and our infrastructure all across rural America. And it doesn't need to be done too late in the process and become a Manhattan Project sized issue under a lot of duress. And so start now, be thoughtful, and, and plan for what we think are some probable outcomes. Now this, this study does, uh, is very granular as it relates to the United States. You, uh, you're, you run a company that is a global company and you have investments it's all local. over the world. Multi local. Multi local. Okay. Um, uh, do you foresee doing this? Uh, I presume that the risks in much of the world are even, you know, mm -hmm. even greater than, yeah. than they are here. I mean, certainly in the tropical yeah. latitudes they would be. So how do you think about uh, uh, making the, this kind of risk assessment beyond just your U.S. operation? Yeah. So two things I think that come from being multi-local. One is we work with farmers today that are growing corn on the equator. And so they're experiencing already some of the conditions that we anticipate might be experienced in southern Indiana. 15 to 25 years forward. And so taking those lessons and helping uh, adaptation and adoption of, of those technologies can certainly happen. But having a map similar to what we have for the US Midwest for central south of Brazil, would that be helpful to people as they think about what kind of livestock housing facilities they build? You can go through a long list of capital judgments that are being made now that would end up with a better decision if they had the kind of data that's available in this open source. Well, yesterday, I just make a, a personal comment about this. I was reading the report on the plane back from Arizona. My wife and I have decided we need to find a warm weather uh, uh, place to get out of Minnesota in the winter. We don't have one. And so we're going to look at Arizona and maybe Naples or something like that. I'm reading this report, and uh, those are both bad ideas, uh, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> One of them will be underwater, and the other one will be 120 degrees year-round. So, uh, so uh, we've got to recalibrate that whole thing. This came at a very advantageous time for me. If you wait long enough, you'll be building it in, in Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right, or, or Vermont, or, or Manitoba, or uh, some such place. Um, well, this is great. We, we've got a, an audience that I'm sure has questions, and so uh, if uh, uh, Christine... Uh, uh, Steve, I just want to say one thing because I, I think it's important to, to, to mention this. We've been talking a lot about adaptation and dealing with what, what's coming, but the, I think the other thing the report shows is we've got time to avoid the worst outcomes and if, if we start to act soon. And business can't do that. Government needs to do that. And one of the things that Greg and I and all of us hope is that we will see business start to play a bigger role in, in lobbying government to take the actions that, that they need to take. And so we, you know, we, we had sort of three objectives for business here, very clear objectives. Number one, integrate this into their uh, decision-making process, business decision-making process. Make wise business decisions, adapt, harden, make them more resilient, make a big difference, Num number one. And number two, disclose data, and investors to call on them to disclose data. Very, very important. So everyone can manage those risks and understand those risks. And thirdly, let their representatives in government here, because too often when we talk to members of Congress and the Senate, 
they're not hearing from businesses who really understand these risks and are already starting to man manage some of them. But sorry, anyway. Well, I'll stay on that point for a second. Uh, you uh, uh, authored an op-ed uh, at the time the, 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 uh, uh, the initial report came, was released that, that uh, uh, proposed a carbon tax as one way to, uh, for uh, the, the government to, uh, to attack this because it would create incentives that, that then individual businesses would, would uh, use to, uh, uh, would motivate them to, to reduce their emissions. Um, but uh, you were commenting to me earlier that you think that's probably not a realistic in this political environment. What, what, kind, of, uh, what kind of actions do you consider to be most uh, possible in, in, uh, politically in, uh, in the environment we're in right well, now? First of all, as I said, I thought it was very, very important that this study not get caught up in, uh, in one policy response or, or, or another. I wrote an op-ed, and it's pretty hard to write an op-ed without saying, what would you do, okay? <laughs> and I think a carbon tax is very easy to misunderstand because you have to say, what are you going to tax, how much, what are you going to do with the proceeds? You know, you could, you could make it pro-growth and use it to reduce corporate taxes. There's a lot of things you could do with it. So I think what, what I will say is I'm going to make, say something which I think is much more positive, which is what we're seeing, we can focus on the negatives in terms of what isn't being done in Washington. But what is being done at the local level, what you see being done in certain cities, what Mike Bloomberg has done in New York, what's being done in places... In, all sorts of cities in the West and, and, and around this country is pretty extraordinary. So there's been a lot that's being done. And urbanization is going to drive a lot of what takes place, whether it's in China or, you know, it, you know it, 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 in other parts of the world. And so U.S. cities are leaders. And one of the things I've been really, really encouraged by is the number of cities that are wanting to use this model and as assess their risk. But in terms of what will happen in, in, in Washington and when there will be a, 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 a market response, I don't have a, a, a prediction there. Okay. Um, if we have questions, do we have mics in the audience? Uh, let's start over here. You want to stand up? And could you say, identify yourself and... and uh, yeah, Thomas Paulson from Cornerstone Capital. And I, I'm sorry, I didn't, part of the relative. 80% who has not read Risky Business. Um, however, Secretary Paulson, I have been in the process of reading On the Brink. And I had a couple of questions from your uh, biography of that period of time. But first, I'd like to say, as a citizen, a father, a homeowner, and a person who is employed in the financial markets, thank you very much for your public service. And so, I, I, I in know, this, I know this is not a congressional hearing now. So, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, in your book, you describe uh, your earlier period as secretary and how you observed risks developing in the markets and home ownerships and housing took you a bit by by surprise. But you were attuned to the gathering storms. You also observed in your book that about every eight years we have a financial crisis of one type or another. So as we look f at eight years past 2008 coming up, what are you looking at now that gives you comfort or concern? Thank you. Okay, I'll, you see brevity is not one of my real virtues and particularly on this question, so I'll try to be really concise here because I, I think no matter what political or economic system you have, as long as you have banks and you have markets, there'll be flawed government policies, which will lead to excesses, and you'll have crises. So the question is, you don't want them to spill over and, and become a, you know, a, a one, once every hundred year flood. So you want to get the excesses early, and you want to have the tools to manage it. And, and I take much greater comfort that the, the banking system is better capitalized, better regulated, that all of the major financial institutions have a common regulator in the Fed. Uh, so I, I, I see many positive things, 
So what, what I focus on are the things that aren't done yet. Uh, you know, for instance, when we put Fannie and Freddie into conservatorship, we said this is a flawed model, okay? We are over-incenting housing. When you look at the tax code and the federal home loan banks and Fannie and Freddie, and so this is a timeout, let's fix it. Right now, it's like a heroin in you know, the arm where we're, it, it's, 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 it's contributing positive uh, uh, cash flow and uh, funds to the federal government, and we're not fixing it. Uh, I'm not predicting a crisis right away as a result of that. I think when I say what, what are the kinds of things we need to do to minimize the likelihood of future uh, crises, I th think they're all the same things we need to do to sort of fix our economy and make it more competitive, dealing with the sorts of issues that you've, you've all focused on. You know, the fiscal issues, health care reform, uh, social security reform, you know, uh, immigration reform, uh, tax reform. You know, we need a tax system that's going to let us raise the revenues we need and still create jobs and growth. And, and so I focus on those things and then some of the things that could lead to bubbles. And I've been a big proponent of the Fed policies because it's no mean feat to delever and to be have been growing at 2% since the third quarter of, of, of 2009. But, you know, ultimately you can't stay addicted to low interest rates too, too long or you're going to create bubbles elsewhere and there's secondary and tertiary effects. We, so, so there's there, there are things, but most of the things that I look at and am concerned about are outside of the U.S. right now, and uh, and, and so I I'm not predicting a, a a financial crisis in the U.S. soon. But, but That's what, good but, news. But, but, but what, what, what do I know? You know, <laughs> <laughs> these things are other other audience questions. Do we have a mic? Does he have a mic? All right, well, thank you so much. I'm Ellen Anderson with the University of Minnesota and also a recovering politician. And I would like to ask you, Secretary Paulson, um, in light of your comments about the carbon tax and about the ability of state or of local governments and local leaders to really make progress, if I could ask what you think of the idea of a state like Minnesota, for example, enacting some sort of a smart pro-growth carbon tax. Would that make sense? Would that be a helpful way to move the ball forward? And I wonder if there'd be any way for that business leaders would ever support such yeah. an idea in well, your thinking. Well, well, I think it is very complicated to figure out how to do something when we have businesses, you know, our, you know, our, 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 our national there, it is, I, I think it's very hard to have a, you know, I'm not against it, and it makes sense in certain areas and in certain situations, but I think it's really difficult to, to, to do something like that on a statewide basis. And uh, so I think that's more challenging. It, it, I think it makes more sense to, if you're going to put a price on carbon to do it, uh, to do it domestically, and I think it can be done domestically, even though businesses are global if it's done properly, and uh, and, and it's phased in over time, and uh, and st starting at a you know at, at a more modest level, but again, I don't want to get into dis discussing you know how you how you design a a a carbon tax today, and I I like your question in the sense that you're looking for things that you can do here, but there's a lot that businesses can do here uh, and a lot that they can do to become more efficient and to reduce their carbon footprint uh, uh, while we're waiting for a national response. Do you feel like the uh, 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 recent uh, agreements with the Chinese are an important step in the uh 
in the direction oh, oh, we need to go? You, you betcha. You, you know that the um, that this we aren't ultimately going to solve this and present prevent the very worst outcomes uh, if we don't have a global solution. And China is by far the biggest emitter of carbon, and uh, and it's a natural for the U.S. and China to work together on this. We innovate better than anyone in the world. They can roll out and test new technologies, and they are going to be you know, perceived to be a, a leader uh, in 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 the developing world. And so I think to get China to do what they've done, first of all, the fact that they did it with the U.S. was very important substantively and symbolically. Our two countries, it's so important that we work together when we have common interests. So that is very important. What they agreed to substantively was very important. And then I think it, it really increases the odds that you'll see other nations following suit and increases the chances that there will be more good things coming out of uh, out of Paris. So don't let people uh, try to fool you into believing that this wasn't that this wasn't important for the Chinese to do this. This was this, this was very important, and all Americans should be glad that they're making progress because the, the, we live in one world, and a ton of carbon emitted from China is every bit as harmful as from from the U.S. and China has also got a big ecological footprint around the world. And so, you know, the next 300 million people going to the cities in China are going to be not only important to the Chinese in terms of their economic and their environmental health, but to the whole rest of the world in terms of its economic and environmental health. So it's really important our two countries work together. And to me, that was a real bright spot. And I very much applaud the Obama administration, and this is coming from a Republican, for having done that terrific thing. Question back here, Kristen? Here. Okay, over here. Hello, my name is Will Roach. I'm with Baker Tilly. Uh, we've had uh, energy independence as a policy for many years, yet we're enjoying as consumers low gas prices. And we're also seeing layoffs in North Dakota down through uh, Texas. What uh, can you put in context uh, risk in terms of uh, our in current energy state and uh, both long term and short term, both for economically and politically? Greg, to you. I guess I'd rather talk about food security, but. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I think we all live in a world uh, of risk, and price is one of those risks. If we cannot prove that this technology that's had, had such a miraculous impact on the degree of self-sufficiency in hydrocarbons in the U.S., if, if we can't prove that the cost of extracting those resources is competitive with other sources outside of our own borders, we inevitably, in a competitive world, are, are going to face reduced employments, whether it's in the Bakken or the Permian or, or wherever. So, to me, it's back to Hank's comment about innovation, be it in food security or energy security, it is a competitive activity. And I think for the U.S. to try to shield itself from the price movements in, in global energy is to deny us uh, uh, calling out our most competitive spirits to be innovative. I think the fact that we are an open energy market and we are an open agricultural market energizes everybody's creativity. Today, people would tell you we cannot produce oil for $34 a barrel in North Dakota. Okay, so be it. Does that have to remain the case in, in perpetuity? Are there more advancements in cost? Do we need to continue to spend $12 or $13 a barrel to haul that oil to market because we won't build a pipeline? I mean, I can offend a third of the audience here as we talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, I'm back to the principle, I think markets and the powerful price signal that comes from market prices can actually be a positive in, in this case, and we shouldn't look at it as, as a negative event, but as a call to action to continue this uh, innovative progress that's allowed us to get to where we are. I happen to agree with you. So. We talked about innovation, uh, we'll get to the next question, but innovation, you know, which has had these remarkable results in terms of extraction of uh, of, uh, of oil and, and fossil fuels. Is there any innovation that either of you see on the horizon 
uh, related to mitigation of carbon emissions that's really significant? I mean, could we, could we be on anywhere near the verge of some kind of a breakthrough that either through recapture or mitigation of emissions could, could uh, through private industry innovation, really affect this issue? I, I had someone the other day ask me when you were in Washington, you know, was there good news you saw? And I remember when I was there saying, I don't see any low-hanging fruit. You know, there's Social Security was analytically simple, but it was politically complex. Other things like healthcare were analytically complex and politically complex. And if I wanted to feel good, I went to the Department of Energy for a day, and I had people come out and talk about some of the technologies that were coming, you know, that were the progress we were making. Some were five years away, some were 10 years away or whatever. And so what I do is when I look at this, rather than trying to say pick a winner, because t to me, some of the breakthroughs I've seen in solar have been extraordinary in terms of the, the investments that have been made there. And you look at uh, some of the clean coal technologies, and there's a lot more work that needs to be done in carbon capture and sequestration, but there's, there, there's progress being made there. There's a whole series of things around, uh, you know, uh, around batteries, just, just a whole series of things that are, are in the works that to me are exciting. And one of the things as I look at it, and one of the reasons why I had favored putting a price on, uh, on carbon, and I would like to see, not pick winners, but see a, a series of these things uh, uh, work with a number of these technologies. Uh, and, and I also think that it's such a huge issue, we should have more basic research. The work that is being done in our national labs, we should need more of it. We should, this is, this is huge, and so I'm just a big fan of research and then having the right incentives and not picking winners. And I also, there's some fascinating things also in the nuclear area in, in, in terms of not just fission, but fusion, some of the things that are potentially out there. And so there's, again, interesting technologies coming. And, uh, but I don't also like to have people say, I'm not a big believer in waiting for a silver bullet because we've got tech, plenty of technologies today and things we can use today to, to, to go a long way towards solving the problem. And this is cumulative. So all those that say, obviously we want to roll out, the key is rolling out new clean energy technologies at scale in the developing market. That's the developing world. That's what we all want to do. But there's plenty of technologies today. You know, today we've got the knowledge that we didn't have years ago, and we've got the technologies that we didn't have years ago. So there's a very little excuse for not using them and dealing with this, this problem. Well, I'll use some examples from, <clears throat> from this room. In the reception time, I had a chance to talk to the team with Ecolab. They're trying to figure out a way to clean food plants with water that's 40 degrees warmer. Billions of BTUs. The team's here from Mosaic. The amount of nitrogen fertilizer, which is made from natural gas, that's needed to raise a bushel of corn has gone down 40 percent in the last 40 years. You can go around the room. Last night we met with a person that owns a family dairy farm at, at a reception we had with Hank. They're putting in anaerobic digestion at the individual farm level. Billions of cubic meters of methane that can be used to heat the water to clean the cattle and provide uh, affordable food. And so I think Hank's point, don't wait for silver bullets. It's each individual com uh, company, each individual homeowner the compound effect of 10 years of all of us making thousands of micro decisions to do more with less, trillions and trillions of megawatts. I guess it's probably not appropriate for me to ask you how that anaerobic digestion methane mitigation works specifically, right? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the cargo people that are here know, I'd be glad to tell you. I'm not sure I want to know. <laughs> Do we have time for any more questions? No? Okay, well, please join me in thanking our, our guests today. They've been a very, very instructive. The Economic Club of Minnesota's mission is to provide a world-class nonpartisan forum for national and international leaders in business and public policy 
to discuss ideas that affect how Minnesota can better compete in the global economy. The Economic Club of Minnesota, engaging the world, strengthening Minnesota.